We're a business, we're a, a tourism attraction, we're a, a, a nature conservation organisation, we're a heritage organisation. Climate change impacts on all of those things. Dave Burgess, Regional Policy Manager for the National Trust in the southeast of England. We have an interesting position. We own and manage a very wide range of properties around the country, so we're actually being affected by climate change in terms of our day-to-day -day business. We're under no illusions that climate change is happening and we have to, to move forward in a much more uh, effective way to solve the problems. So we're learning, along with everybody else, we're looking at how we can mitigate our impacts, how we can uh, reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide and we're also looking at how we can manage our gardens and our land more effectively to cope with changes in the climate and by doing that we hope we can actually demonstrate to our members and our supporters what the art of the possible is and the sorts of things that they can do in their own lives to make a difference too. So I think the whole team is really quite into being green and I think I really just am coordinating a lot of very enthusiastic people in that respect. Ed Eikin, head gardener at Nyman Gardens. As gardeners we need to just minimise our inputs in every way that we can. You know, does this plant really need more water, more fertiliser, more pesticide? Or actually will it be fine without those things? Imagine the visitors probably quite enjoy climate change at this moment in time because it means that we can present a year-round garden. There's probably always quite a few surprises, you know, all the camellias are out a little bit early at the moment, the snowdrops are out, are out a little bit early. But what they can also come and see is, is really good practical adaptations to climate change. Um, if they're worried about their carbon footprint, they can come and see how to do composting at home, which obviously takes a big burden off the environment. Composting is a big thing for us. We, we really do convert virtually all of our garden waste, including sort of nasty perennial weeds, into compost. So immediately you haven't got the situation where you're dumping vegetative matter, you're not burning woody waste, um, we're not buying in nearly as much compost as we would. We're creating an indigenous compost on site, anything between maybe 75 to 150 cubic metres a year, which we then put straight back onto the ground. So it's immediately reducing a big sort of garden input. Fahrenheit. Just try and use as little main water as we possibly can. You know, the very intense drought we had in 2006, not a splash of mains water hit our lawns. I think we're going to get more into rechargeable systems. Um, we're looking to increase our, our bank of renewable energy um, source, so we think that we can start to really have genuine zero emission gardening here. Mike Innerdale, property manager, High Peak. So these peatlands that we have here are one of the most important carbon stores in the world. We're only just really discovering that, that how important that is. And the UK has 15% of the world's peat. And so uh, we have a real big contribution to make. It's like our tropical rainforest, I guess. But what we're trying to do is kind of trying to secure the future of this peat that's been eroded away by uh, protecting it with heather brash, putting grass and heather seed down and lime and fertilising to kind of make it sweet and enrich it to then uh, protect the peat for future generations and help to start to kind of store the carbon. If we didn't do that work, the, the peat would uh, release carbon, continue to release carbon into the atmosphere at an alarming rate. What we want to do is turn that around, uh, stop it releasing carbon into the atmosphere and actually make a carbon sink. It, it, we reckon it's about uh, the equivalent to 15 thousand car journeys a year if we can lock up the carbon here which is really really important stuff compared to some of the other measures we're taking. Um, using helicopters it, it is a short-term loss I guess for a long-term gain. The site that we need to restore is five kilometres from the nearest road and we need to move 150,000 tonnes of brash. How do you do that without machinery on very very um, fragile soil so we can't drive across We're totally self-sufficient in terms of all our energy needs. Uh, we have a natural spring water that supplies the site, which meets all our water needs for, for drinking, washing and in the toilets as well. Sarah Parsons, Learning and Access Officer, Gibson Mill. We generate electricity here on site using photovoltaic panels and also water turbines. We can immediately identify what we're producing where it's being produced and also where it's being used throughout the mill complex. If the turbines actually stop today, we do have enough 
electricity and the batteries to keep us going for um, about 10 to 12 days anyway. Because we generate our own electricity here and we're not using power from the national grid, it's not being generated by uh, fossil fuels. Um, we're using renewable, sustainable sources, the water and the daylight. Mark Draper, caretaker warden at Gibson Mill. For heating, for hot water and for ambient space heating, we use uh, wood from the, the, the woodland around here and we manage the woodland on a sustainable basis and so um, everything we do um, will not affect the long-term running of the estate and will be, the, the trees will be replaced by other trees and so it will sustain for generations to come. Overall, with the woodland uh, absorbing CO2, we're probably in a carbon negative situation. Um, that means that we're not polluting the atmosphere and adding to the climate change. Paul Dern, house manager at Polesden Lacey. We were the first historic house to trial the new range for Philips with their experimental low energy uh, light bulb. Uh, we had a number of considerations to take into account, not just um, conservation guidelines in terms of uh, uh, any additional UV, uh, ultraviolet light, or extra heat that may potentially be involved. Uh, also, we had to think about its historical presentation, things like the colour of the light, is the light too white, or would it, would, would it wash out the room, and also things like the weight of a low energy light bulb. We are saving somewhere in the region of 15 tonnes. Uh, a kind of easy comparison for me to do is an average person uh, over a year, it's about 10 tonnes of CO2. And just by switching a set of light bulbs to low energy light bulbs here at Polesden, we are saving 15 tonnes. The other direct benefit are we, we are using lower wattage, so it's less energy consumption. And a, and, a, and a monetary benefit is that we're saving about £3,000 per year, which can be redirected into other conservation projects in the house and on the estate. What we're having to adapt is, is the message we're getting across to people to help them understand climate change and why we need to work with natural processes on the coast. Mark Wardle, head warden at East Head. The sea level in the harbour has risen more, more recently than, than it has in, in all the time that it's been monitored. In the last uh, 10 years or so, the changes here have been much more dramatic. Everywhere where we've got soft coastline, sustainable management is what we want. And that involves working with the processes of, of nature and not against them. This is, this is um, about the area where the sea got through in 1965. People see the Trust as an organisation that isn't necessarily there to manage change and I think locals have struggled to come to terms with the fact that we will watch some of East Head drop into the sea. Some of the coastline will have to be sacrificed if we're going to work with nature. Not in a catastrophic way, in a, in, in a very much in a managed way. The inevitable is going to happen to some houses that are too close to the sea. There is a really nice level of trust between, say, gardeners, National Trust gardeners and the public. They come to see us and, you know, they, they see us as setting some sort of standard for how to garden. And, and the challenge is to trust is to tell those stories and make them real to people in, in these beautiful landscapes that people to come and visit and think are naturally here and are going to be absolutely fine and make people realise the challenges that we have and they have to help overcome them. It's no use just um, keep banging on about climate change is happening. We need to be educating people and informing them and helping them so that they can all make small changes to their lifestyles and work patterns so that we can reduce the impact that we're having on climate change. When I wake up in the morning, climate ch I wish that climate change would just go away and, 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 and I could get on with a, a different angle of my day job. Well, the, the fact is climate change is here. It's not going to go away and one of our most difficult jobs is helping people understand how we are going to manage with climate change. Well I suppose if, if you go back 20, 30, 40 years, like everybody else, we might not have seen this one coming, but it's here, it's now, it's happening, it's absolutely central to everything the National Trust does.